Hey guys, we are moving forward in our Heaven and Hell series uh, this week, and we're going to be uh, focused on what the new heavens and the new earth uh, will look like. That's uh, going to be what you guys focus on most in discussion groups um, and uh, a good portion of our lesson. Uh, next week, we'll look at uh, what we're going to be doing on the new heavens and the new earth. Uh, and this week, we're focused on what they will actually look like. Uh, and so uh, that's going to be the, the content of your discussion groups. Um, first, you can toss up if people have comments or questions or clarifications that they need from uh, the large group lesson. Uh, try to keep this time focused on uh, questions that are specific or clarifications people need from what we actually talked about uh, today or that day. Um, don't let them venture too far into the future. Uh, and so if they're asking questions or seeking clarification on something that you perceive, we're probably going to cover that uh, or potentially we'll cover that in the next couple of weeks. Feel free to say we're going to cover that in the next couple of weeks. Uh, try to stay focused on what we learned today. Uh, high school group kind of ventured into this territory last week, which is normal. We have a lot of questions about all of this and it's normal for it to all uh, kind of stream together. But um, we don't want to um, go too far ahead in our series or lose focus on uh, kind of the topic at hand. So try to keep that focused. Uh, and then secondly, uh, I do have a little teaching portion for you guys to cover in discussion groups. Um, I don't like to do this, but sometimes it just uh, happens this way where there's something I think needs to be clarified um, and I couldn't find space to fit it in our large group lesson. And so I want you guys to cover this. Um, it may be that some of our students are aware of this um, and could even explain this themselves. If you kind of get the, the feeling going through that um, you think that's the case, let a student take over and try to explain this and you can even help them along the way. Um, we want to be talking probably as, as little as we can. That's why I don't like to put teaching here um, if I can help it. Uh, but I think this is uh, something that could be confusing if we didn't clarify, and so I want it to, to be covered here. Hopefully you guys can go through it semi-quickly. Um, in Revelation 21, uh, I'll use this language some uh, in the lesson as well. Uh, John uh, says he sees a new heavens and a new earth because the old heavens and the old earth had passed away. Um, but we're going to be mostly focused in our lesson on what does the new earth look like. We'll talk a lot about that. We won't talk a lot about the new heavens. And so you're going to ask them, what, it, what does John mean by the new heavens and what does that look like? Um, and see if any students uh, have an immediate correct answer to that. Um, if not, um, go through this little teaching portion. Um, the, the writers, the authors of scripture use the word heaven or heavens in a couple of different ways. Um, this is just how they deployed that language. Uh, they viewed uh, three kind of levels of heaven-ish. Uh, there was a third heaven uh, that Paul mentions. He actually says, called up to the third heaven in 2 Corinthians 12 to, I would read through these verses. Uh, he says, uh, called up to the third heaven. This is what we think of when we hear heaven. That's where God dwells. Uh, but they also use the word heaven or heavens to describe um uh, space, what we would call kind of outer space, where the, the moon and the stars and uh, the sun are located, and they would call those the, the hosts of heaven. Uh, and they also used heaven occasionally to refer to kind of the atmosphere or the sky where the birds fly around. Um, again, read through those verses, and that will kind of demonstrate that. There's plenty of verses you could go to to illustrate this point. Um, and once you have this understanding of heaven, uh, in your mind, um, as you read through scripture, you'll probably, in most cases, be able to discern uh, which one are they actually talking about. Uh, so this understanding of heavens makes us maybe rethink, what does John actually mean when he says a new heaven and a new earth? I think we automatically assume that means God's going to recreate the earth where we live. He's also going to recreate heaven uh, where he lives. Um, and I think that's that's probably unlikely, uh, and a lot of scholars would say that as well. Um, he's probably referring to kind of all of the universe being 
um, renewed and recreated. So not just the physical earth, but uh, the sky, the stars, outer space, the sun, the moon, the planets. He's trying to include all of these things in that phrase, new heavens and new earth. He's not saying, I don't think, uh, that God's going to recreate earth and he's also going to recreate heaven where he lives. That kind of um, begs the question that uh, God is, is currently and has been for thousands of years dwelling in a sin-tainted place in heaven that needs restoration and recreation, which seems um, problematic. Um, and so uh, I think that's what John is referring to. And I also believe people understand this in different ways slightly because it's not you know clearly outlined, but it, it really seems like in eternity, heaven as we know it, where God lives, and the new earth uh, almost merge together um, in eternity. In Revelation 21, we see the new Jerusalem comes down out of heaven. Uh, we believe that's currently, the new Jerusalem is already there in heaven. It in, uh, When the new earth is created, it comes down and becomes a part of the new earth and God himself comes down and makes his dwelling place with man. And so it seems like the two really merge kind of in um, in eternity. For sure there's not a God, uh, God lives there in heaven and we live here on the new earth. That's not the picture at all that we get in Revelation 21. So these are just some good things to, to clear up with students. Uh, again, hopefully you can go through that semi, semi quickly. If a student seems to have this understanding already, let them walk through it. If they all, for some reason, I would be surprised to have this understanding, then you can skip it, but I feel like that's, that's probably unlikely. Um, question three is this view that kind of I'll present in the large group lesson of the new earth to earth-centered and not God-centered enough, and then ask them why or why not. And so I'll present this view of the new earth with natural wonders and architectural beauty and trees and animals and uh, a lot of continuity between what we know and love on this earth will be present on the new earth, just in an enhanced and a perfected state. Um, but some people might say, and uh, that kind of shakes up our view of heaven, which a lot of people assume and, and students have kind of asked in their questions over the last couple of weeks, are we just going to sing and worship the whole time and just look at God and worship him or listen to a sermon the whole time in heaven? Is it just going to be an unending church service because we're supposed to be uh, God-centered and God-focused um, and God is all that we need uh, uh, in eternity? And um, so ask that question, see what people think, see how they're able to explain that. Uh, and then I would have you guys go through this exercise, read through uh, these verses of Psalm 104. I would just tell everybody in the group, open up to Psalm 104 and this, just go around in a circle. You read verse 1, you read verse 5, you read verse 10 and 11. Um, and just go around until you complete all these verses. But what Psalm 104 does is it calls for us to praise the Lord. And it's calling for us to praise the Lord for his works in creation and the beauty and the power that he displays in creation. And this is not a unique psalm. You can see this all over the Psalms and all over the Bible that we're to praise God for uh, his attributes which includes his beauty and his creativity and his grace in sustaining all things and his, his power. Um, and all of these things are best seen and best praised by beholding God's works. And so as we go through the new earth and we see the beauty that is woven into it and we see um, God providing the needs for all of humanity and for all of the animal kingdom, uh, we uh, will be worshiping. Uh, so we'll be worshiping 24-7 in heaven, uh, but not in this narrow view of worship that only includes singing uh, or reading the Bible or hearing a sermon. Uh, we will uh, adore and praise and worship God day by day, moment by moment, as we uh, behold his attributes in the new earth. And that doesn't exclude the fact that we'll see God face to face. That doesn't exclude the fact that we will sing and give praise to the Lord. Um, but we will worship as we go throughout the new creation and we see God on display in all that he has, he's made. 
Uh, the last verse of that psalm that you guys will read says that God himself rejoices in the works of his hands. He enjoys displaying creativity and beauty and power. Um, and so he will continue to do that on the new earth, and he intends for us to enjoy and delight in that uh, as well. And so uh, that's how we, we reconcile all of that, that we will be worshiping. We'll have a, a perfect ability to um, see that everything around us comes from and is sustained by God, right? We know that that's true now, um, and yet we we forget about that. We refuse to recognize that. We refuse to thank God for that in eternity. We will know that, and we'll know that perfectly all of the time, and that will lead us to um, praise and adoration for God all of the time. So uh, that's question three. You may not get to the last question. Uh, that's okay if you don't get there. Uh, it's just how does this view of eternity maybe impact the way that we should live now, day to day? Uh, and I've got a couple of things for you there. We've, we've touched on a couple of those before, uh, but that last one is maybe one to hit on if you have time, uh, that it should uh, greatly decrease our fear of death. Uh, Hebrews 2 talks about how that's part of what Christ's work on the cross is supposed to do. It's supposed to alleviate the fear of death for us. And for many Christians, because we struggle to envision what heaven is like, or really the new earth is like, um, we... We still fear death. We still fear leaving this earth. Um, even if we're really confident that God is real and that we are saved and we're going to go be with him, we struggle to leave the earth because we uh, we don't know what we're headed towards. We, we don't have a good picture of what we're headed towards. And we think we might be leaving a lot of stuff that we love on this present earth that won't be there uh, on the new earth. And uh, this view of the new earth, which is, is biblical, um, frees us from that. Uh, we don't have to cling so tightly to this earth as if uh, we'll never get to see the beauty of this earth again. We'll never get to experience these kinds of things. And so I have to spend my whole life trying to enjoy as much of the natural beauty on this earth as I can because maybe I won't get to do that after I die. For Christians, um, that's not true. Uh, and that doesn't mean, obviously, that we shouldn't go and explore natural beauty now. We should, and that should, just like the psalmist, that should enhance our worship of God here and now. But we'll also get to do that on the new earth. And so we have the freedom to um, uh, not spend all of our time doing those things, to not uh, look at death with an incredible amount of fear and uncertainty. Uh, which really changes the way that you, you can lead your life. So uh, that's the questions we've got for this week. I'll see you guys on Sunday.